please welcome Michael Quinn. First of all, thank you for being here on our my, stage. My uh, pleasure. Thanks what for does it mean to be the CEO of the International Ethics and Leadership Bureau? I teach police ethics. Uh, specifically, I teach a program called Peer Intervention, where we teach cops to intervene with other cops when they're involved in either misconduct or they're starting to kind of lose control of their lives in general. So, for instance, if you and I were partners, and you lose your temper, which can happen. Wait, so I'm the bad cop in this situation? Well, <laughs> you're the cop that tonight lost his temper. Maybe you've had a domestic at home. Maybe you just didn't get enough sleep because you got a new baby in the house. Somebody says something to you that really catches you sideways, and you start to lose it. My job is to step in and stop that and just say, I got this. And your job, because you've already made a promise to me, a commitment to me, to accept an intervention if another partner comes in. And we teach it so that the whole department does it. It's not just the partners. It's from the chief all the way down to the secretary that works in transcription. Anybody can step up and say, stop. So think about this. When you teach these kinds of programs, is there any pushback from people who don't want to say stop to their fellow officers or their secretary or whoever in the, in the police department? You know, it's really interesting. I, I spent four years working with the New Orleans PD, and they put this program in place through their whole department. And initially, there was a little bit of reluctance. Uh, they're under a consent decree. They've got very tight rules on operating and how they're going to do business. But when you sat down with the cops and did the training and said, look, this is for your benefit. 3,000 some cops go to prison about every 18 months. We want to keep you out of prison. We want to keep you on the job. We want to keep you happy. And by the time they look through it, they go, well, this just makes perfect sense. Right. Well, it's not only to keep them out of prison. It's also not to hurt the people that they're there to protect, right? That's absolutely right. Has your work influenced any Minneapolis or Minnesota police departments? Uh, we did a class up in, uh, i got to think about where I was. Uh, One of those Northwestern towns. Minnesota. It's hard to remember that part of the state yeah. at some point. <laughs> well, it's awful close to North Dakota, you know. So yeah, yeah, exactly. It gets hazy. Was yeah, it a yeah, dream? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I've been up there, and I've been out to Eden Prairie PD, and... All the cops, when you first step in the room, tend to go like this, you know? What's, well, this, what's this guy going to tell Isn't us? that the first thing you're taught? You sit together and then just, like, push your biceps up in your shirt, right? You That's tend to, yeah, you tend to see that, don't you? Yeah. I've watched enough movies. Even in Zootopia, they do that. The cops, you know, I remember that. They were all animals doing that same pose. I remember that. But, but John, what we do is when we, when we bring it down to it, the terms of officer survival, in other words, I don't need only, I'm not only making a commitment to you, I'm making a commitment to your family that I'm not going to let you do something that's going to cost you your career. So you have to frame it. So this it isn't in just, just about misconduct. This is about me making a commitment to you that I'm not going to let you do something that's going to dishonor you, your family, or the badge, any of those three. So you have to frame it in terms of this is for your own protection rather than... And your families. Yes. And your families. Yes. Okay. And then cops, then cops hold up their heads and say, well, wait a minute. But when you frame it as officer survival, then you get their attention. So what is the impact of this training? Once you got their attention, what does that actually mean when police officers are out in the cities and towns across the state? Well, New Orleans had one of the worst reputations in the whole country in terms of uh, corruption. We think of corruption here as excessive force, uh, maybe excessive use of deadly force. New Orleans, it was police officers killing other police officers. Wait. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the level of corruption that was down there. Well, they've gone. In the one year since we started the training, we did the March training, uh, March 2016, I trained their trainers. As of the, this month, I think they've seen either, depending how you look at the stats, either a 20% or 70% reduction in their use of force complaints. Wow. Think about that. Those are huge numbers. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, it's, not, it's not just me. And, and so this is all, your, your essential training is just someone, is just telling people to go, whoa, whoa. Dude, that's like essentially the thesis of your training. And so this is revolutionary? Well, it shouldn't be, should it? I mean, no, it, just it makes doesn't sense. sound like it. It just makes sense. Here's, here's all it words. There's an oath they take. It says, I promise I will always have the courage to stand by you and for you. I promise that I will never allow through action or inaction any act that dishonors you, your family, or the badge. I ask only that you promise to do the same for me. And that's the whole that's the whole program and so this is again i'm sorry <laughs> new <laughs> no i from night in 1987 and 88 i ran two undercover units for three years in minneapolis probably the most 
the place where you're most liable to, to find real problems, right? We had zero complaints of excessive force, no complaints of racial profiling, no complaints of test lying. We put 115 felons back in prison, and we got, we got zero complaints, not from anything or anybody, for a three-year period. And we did it because we did just what I talked about right now. The back in 19, Back in 1987, we just called it good police work. And now it's a revolution. Of now all of a sudden it's a revolution, yeah. What would you say in Minneapolis and the Twin Cities in particular, how would you assess the state of accountability and police training in, in the Twin Cities police forces right now? Well, we've got two problems. Uh, we've got this super emphasis on officer survival that's being promoted across the country. Uh, most of that's coming out of a program called Force Science Research. Uh, Dr. William Lewinsky, who was originally out of Mankato State University. Oh, what? So we're yeah. responsible for this? We Minnesota is responsible Minnesota for this? Minnesota started this. Mi what? Yeah. So we started this back when? How long ago was this? This would have been the 1990s that he was doing this and asked me to actually be part of it at one point. And his whole, his whole theory which has no scientific basis, by the way, and has been debunked, is that action beats reaction. So, okay, so he asked the Wodu guy to come on to the action beats reaction, the you basically the preemptive strike the, the exactly. philosophy. Exactly, and, and I've, I've been an expert witness in a number of cases across the country where officers have shot unarmed citizens, and they've gotten away with it each time because they said, well, I didn't see a weapon, but if I'd have waited, he might have been able to shoot me. And they're getting away with this in front of grand juries. Now, they don't get away with it on a, on a civil suit, because in a civil suit, these cities are getting hammered. But they're promoting this idea that I've got to act first or my life's in danger, when in fact, we're only losing maybe 60 cops a year to felonious assaults. We're losing more cops to suicide. We're losing more cops to driving poorly and crashing their own squad cars than we are to bad guys. Well, so this is a really serious topic. Do you feel like we're making any progress in Minnesota? Is there something that we can look forward to or some, something that people in the audience can act or do to, to make this situation better? Well, I've actually, I've actually tried to promote this program. Uh, I sent, I read the newspaper like everybody did, I'm sure, the other day that said the Metro Gang Strike, for, strike Force funding for training, they've spent 660 some thousand dollars and they haven't produced a single day of training in eight years. That somebody ought to be held accountable for that, for one thing. And what I've done is I've said, let's take my program. It works perfectly with the, uh, uh, the body cameras and critical incident team training, which by the way, is not a two hour or four hour program. Critical incident training, de-escalation is a 40 hour program. And if you don't do the 40 hours, all you're getting is somebody saying, hey, don't do this, do it this way, and that's it. Now, some cops are figuring it out that you gotta do that. And some agencies are saying, take your time. You don't have to act initially. What the other the part they're missing, though, mm -hmm. is we aren't telling cops, look, you can say, hey, I'm sorry. So I screw, apologies I screw, are revolutionary as well? Yeah, another one. They say, well, because you're taught when you come out of the department, you don't apologize to anybody. Uh, bullshit. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> really, That's really, right. really. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really oh, appreciate you your time. Michael Quinn, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. My pleasure. I hope your work makes the impact that we want. Thank you so much. <laughs>